this is our first uh, lecture series of the year uh, from Basketball Institute. And we are uh, having a very exciting series of lectures this year. We decided to start with Peace Corps and US Peace Corps role in Iran on September 22nd, because as many of you know, 60 years ago today, President Kennedy signed the legislation creating the US Peace Corps. And we thought it is really appropriate for Iran lecture series to start with that today because the founding of the Peace Corps 60 years ago uh, started and a year later, uh, I defer to the historians on the panel today, I think a year later, I Iran received the first contingent of Peace Corps from United States. Um, the program continued in a robust fashion until 1976. And uh, for, for such a short period of time, I believe over 1,700 Peace Corps volunteers served in Iran in such a short time. They, uh, they had a huge impact in terms of education, uh, help with uh, agriculture, and as we will see today, they served in many parts of the country. And according to one data, they educated close to 6,000 children and individuals in Iran. So we are, we are very happy to start with this program. And we will have a uh, program that includes first uh, a short trailer by two documentary makers, Mr. Mahalati, who's joined us, and Abbas Motlak, also a prominent filmmaker. Uh, many of you may have heard of his name for a film he made on Yazd. So uh, after my introduction, we go to Matt, and uh, he uh, will introduce Professor uh, Jasmine. So before we're showing you the trailer, I'd like to give Hossein a short time to introduce that trailer and then I will show it. So go ahead, Hossein, tell us a little bit about the documentary you and Apples are making. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Bakhtiari, to give us this opportunity. We are just thrilled to uh, be involved in this phenomenal project that started from a, a sort of a, an accident that, that, uh, that um, uh, took place in, uh, in uh, finding a, a friend who was the first American that uh, I met when I was six years old in Shiraz and find him after, uh, I don't know, 50 years in the, in the States and then learn that he was, uh, the reason that he was in Shiraz was because he was uh, part of the Peace Corps. That was the sort uh, that, uh, I, they, that ignited this concept that uh, Abbas and I were contemplating at the time and um, the outcome of which is now before uh, you know a, 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 there's a trailer a short trailer uh, we will have a a longer version program that would be submitted to the conference that is going to be held in October 2nd by the PCIA which is the Iranian Association Peace Corp uh, uh, and of course um, uh, officially it would be um, aired uh, within months uh, in a uh, multi-series format. The concept behind it is just simply to replace the tremendously bad, uh, polit highly politicized memories of the two people, the Americans and the Iranians, with fantastic memories that mo many Americans if not all who have had a chance to visit in Iran and work in Iran have had, or vice versa. Um, and that's basically the, the idea of, of this. I wanted and I wish that we could replace the memories um, of Iranians, of Americans, uh, of the coup, uh, with the um, memories of Samuel Jordan, uh, with memories of uh, Morgan Schuster, the memories of, of course, uh, Howard Baskerville. Uh, and uh, uh, Americans recognize uh, that uh, there were Americans who just did wonderful for Iran. Uh, people like uh, Barkley Moore, 
who stayed uh, instead of two years of a Peace Corp, he stayed uh, three times. He stayed uh, from 64 to, to 70 and worked uh, and almost it became his second home uh, in helping out a tiny village. Or uh, James Dorfee, who built a mosque in a, in a, in a village not far from Mashhad. Uh, and I, you know, I, I'd like to replace the memories of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of uh, uh, Americans, of Iranians, as uh, a you know a political foe uh, that uh, you know do nothing except uh, uh, deal with the you know or, or hostages um, with uh, with uh, Fazel Zadeh, who created Fast Theory, which is the core principle of uh, of uh, computer, or Khwarazmi, which is the father of algorithm, something that we all know. So anyway. This is the whole idea, is to replace the negative, highly politicized uh, uh, overtones of the two people with what was incredible experience for the Americans and Iranians. And that's basically what was behind this. And I'm very much happy that um, I am involved with this. Abbas did a tremendous work. Uh, he is the man in charge. Uh, I was just you know, standing uh, uh, behind the scenes, so to speak, and uh, and uh, cheering up. Uh, we had a, a wonderful experience so far, Treme uh, tremendous uh, uh, welcoming by uh, the members of the uh, Peace Corps volunteers. Um, they do gather together occasionally in the in the in the states and um, and share their memories. And I think it was a opportune time to really uh, make a documentary about this incredible incredible um, uh, experience. That's basically what I wanted to say. Well, thank you very much. So we will start with your trailer and then we okay. will go after you to Professor Matthew sure. Shannon who will introduce Professor Kulai. So let's watch the trailer. Uh, <clears throat> Thank you very much, Hossein and Abbas, for a fantastic trailer, such an exciting documentary we're looking forward to see. And you capture the human basis of that friendship that is really the mission of our institute, too, to build that friendship. And thank you for sharing that trailer with us. I'm sure the audience enjoyed it, too. So uh, with the end of that trailer, we go to Professor Matthew Shannon who will introduce our speaker today, Professor Kulari. Well, thank you so much um, to everybody who's in attendance and to everyone at the Baskerville Institute who made this webinar possible. And Hussein and Abbas, thank you so much for undertaking what I'm sure has been an overwhelming project that we will all you know, benefit from for a long time. The, Kind of combination of the arts and kind of participant memory and scholarship coming together like that in the documentary is just a really impressive thing to see. Uh, so thank you. Uh, it's nice to be here together on this 60th anniversary of Peace Corps, as Fatma mentioned um, when we got started, and it's especially uh, nice to be able to hear from today's uh, distinguished lecturer, uh, Dr. Ostem Kulai. She is a professor of history and chair of the history department, uh, two jobs for sure, uh, at California State University Fullerton. Her articles on women's education in Iran were pioneering when they were published and they continue to influence the historiography on modern Iran and US-Iran relations to this day. She's written widely on other subjects, but her current research focuses on the Peace Corps. Uh, she directs an oral history project on the Peace Corps, specifically Peace Corps Iran, and out of this research has come many publications, including an article in the journal Iranian Studies and multiple book chapters, uh, one of which is in our forthcoming volume, American-Iranian Dialogues, which I'm excited about. Um, and before turning the, the mic over, I'll just read very briefly the way I summarize uh, your contribution to that. Um, uh, book to uh, set the stage uh, a, a bit. Um, frameworks abound for historicizing the program, um, but you draw on 
um, your interviews to explain how Peace Corps Iran was uh, in the phrasing that you use, um, Cold War innovation and deviation. Um, young Americans unwittingly entered Pahlavi era Iran at the height of the White Revolution. And they transformed what was a government initiative into a vehicle for experiencing internationalist growth, acquiring cultural empathy and, and all of the other things. Um, as a result, American volunteers, Iranian students, uh, and others forged lifelong relationships, shared understandings about the worlds they inhabited. Um, ultimately, as much as they did in Iran, um, you ultimately show how the volunteers came back to the United States and the impact was as much in Iran as it was on the politics, emotions, and cookbooks and behavior of the volunteers when they returned. Uh, to the United States. Despite the fact that the program ended in the mid 70s, we still uh, have the legacy of that program today. Um, so um, with that, let's learn more about Peace Corps Iran. Dr. Rostam Kolayi, the floor is yours. Great, thank you so much. I'm going to uh, share my screen uh, so I can pull up my visuals, okay. Can you see those? Okay. Uh, thank, thank you so much, Professor Shannon, for the kind introduction. And, and thank you also to the Baskerville Institute and Dr. Bakhtiari for inviting me to give this anniversary presentation. The film is a tough act to follow. Uh, what an important story and record. Um, thank you to the filmmakers. And I look forward to more conversations about your film uh, at the PCIA conference uh, in a few weekends. So it is an honor to address you all today on the 60th anniversary of the Peace Corps. Uh, for the past several years, as, as Dr. Shannon mentioned, I've been researching a slice of Peace Corps history in the form of its program that operated in Iran. Uh, by training, I'm a historian of modern Iran, so what you'll hear today is, is informed by that perspective. September 5th, 1962 was the date the first group of Peace Corps volunteers departed on a Pan Am flight bound for Tehran. The group of 43 Iran volunteers had excitedly said their goodbyes to friends and family before departing from New York. Their flight was also, um, their flight also included the first Peace Corps groups heading to Afghanistan and Turkey. When the group stepped, when the Iran group stepped into Mehrabad airport, they were greeted by local TV cameras and reporters. Coincidentally and, and tragically, they had arrived the day after a major earthquake had hit Iran, uh, centered in the uh, Ghazvin area. This was the start of an Iran Peace Corps program that lasted 14 years, as you've already heard, and, and that during this time, uh, 1,748 volunteers graduated from approximately 50 training programs and served in Iran alongside uh, many, many support staff and supportive staff. Uh, it launched many unique, meaningful and lasting relationships between uncounted numbers of Iranians and Americans. So in the next 30 minutes, I'll address the following questions. Why Iran? Um, how did the Peace Corps get started there? Uh, what did the program look like during its peak in the mid to late 1960s? And why did it end in 1976? Uh, finally, what made the Peace Corps a unique American interaction with Iran? And what are the legacies of this interaction? Some of the legacies, at least. I've relied on a range of sources to reconstruct the history of Peace Corps Iran. Memoirs and short stories by Iran Peace Corps volunteers provide individual American perspectives, as do oral history interviews that I've conducted with Americans and Iranians who worked with Peace Corps Iran or were touched by it in some way as students, colleagues, or observers. These personal testimonies representing perspectives outside the halls of government capture varied and sometimes contradictory experiences. I also consulted documents addressing US government and Peace Corps agency, um, institutional and administrative concerns. Uh, those are now housed in the US National Archives in College Park, Maryland. 
As a whole, these sources speak to the different layers of relations between Iran and the US, between political elites and other officials on both sides, and between ordinary Iranians and Americans. The crucial missing piece here is Iran records on the Peace Corps, which I've not located in either Iran or the US. So when volunteers first received news about their assignment in Iran, many remembered they had to scramble to find an atlas at their local library to locate Iran in the world. This group of Americans, predominantly recent college graduates, could not know then how much this faraway country would come to shape their lives. As a newly established agency, the Peace Corps too experienced a learning curve, asking universities to quickly develop training for programs that had no history. In the Iran case though, the learning curve was not as steep. Utah State University in Logan had had a long standing connection to Iran or connections to Iran. Starting in 1939, Franklin Harris, an agronomist who had served as a president, a president of both Brigham Young and Utah State Universities, had been working in Iran on contract with the Ministry of Agriculture. In 1950, he became the first director of President Truman's Point for Iran Rural Development Initiative. And then other Utah State employees came to work in Iran on Point Four agricultural projects. Point Four also brought Iran to Utah, so that in the 1950s, Iranian students made up almost 20% of Utah State's international student population. Here we can see that the Peace Corps relied on people, groups, and institutions with Iran experience and connections. President Kennedy's Peace Corps would build on point four aid and development programs in areas such as agriculture, uh, education, community development, medical services, and urban planning. Such development projects became part of the US global strategy based on the idea that technical assistance would bring positive change to combat communism in the third world. By the end of the 1950s, US policymakers were fearing that communism was not just lurking behind the corner, but it was actually winning the battle in the developing world. And then this was the context in which Kennedy promised a Peace Corps of talented and trained Americans to meet the Soviet challenge in his famous October 1960 speech at the University of Michigan. Kennedy's tone was full of youthful optimism and idealism, as the film clip um, also indicated. Uh, he talked about a new frontier, moral leadership, a revolutionary era, and a fight against poverty, inequality, and tyranny. Officially, the Peace Corps Act of 1961 set forth three main objectives to provide trained manpower in the de developing world, to promote a better understanding of Americans in the world, and to increase American knowledge of the world. The new feature the Peace Corps brought to existing Cold War policy was its second and third goals. I'd argue that the Peace Corps did promote a different understanding of Americans in Iran. And as for its third goal, the notion that the volunteer would learn and grow in the process of living and working overseas and bring that knowledge back home was also novel. Rather than a one-way path that had characterized previous US foreign aid and development programs, the Peace Corps acknowledged this kind of reciprocity, at least as far as cultural exchange was concerned. As an American government program, the Peace Corps inevitably relied on its host country's governments to communicate their priorities and needs. And the Iranian Ministry of Education's initial request was for volunteers with experience and training in American agriculture, teaching, and physical education. The first Iran group assembled for training numbered 48. 75% were white men, and the remaining 25% were men of color and women. 
The Peace Corps kickstarted their onboarding with a week of cross-cultural training on a Navajo reservation across the Utah border in Arizona, uh, chosen to provide volunteers with firsthand experience of living in so-called primitive conditions. And then from June to August 1962, soon to be Iran volunteers spent 60 hours a week in Logan, Utah, under what many remember to be a very able set of Utah-based Iranian and American instructors of language, area studies, and cultural orientation. Finally, undergirding Peace Corps training, some volunteers remember was Cold War concerns focusing on the US-USSR rivalry. Though training varied across different Peace Corps Iran groups, generally it paid little attention to contemporary Iranian society and politics, something that proved detrimental to volunteers with limited understanding of the country's social and political tensions and US-Iran relations. The context of Iran accepting Peace Corps volunteers involved a tense relationship between Mohammad Reza Shah Pahlavi and the Kennedy administration, which had its own internal conflicts about handling Iran. US officials were viewing Iran as a vital interest because of its strategic location on the Soviet border and its vast oil reserves. Kennedy's policymakers hoped that Given sufficient prodding, the Shah might initiate meaningful social reforms and bring stability to Iran. Nor did the Shah trust Kennedy, suspecting him of possible plans to end his monarchy. The Kennedy administration had pressured the Shah to accept the premiership of Ali Amini, who would start the reform program that evolved into the White Revolution. Though difficult to say in the absence of direct evidence, the Shah probably recognized the Peace Corps as Kennedy's signature program, whose acceptance and implementation in Iran, alongside the White Revolution, would help him get what he really wanted, U.S. military aid and weaponry. The Shah's U.S.-backed reform program was the White Revolution, whose 1963 launch coincided with the arrival of the Peace Corps. Iran One is the first Peace Corps group um, is often called. Iran One came to Iran in the midst of political upheaval and protests against the Shah. The Shah's white revolution was launched with great fanfare and became his defining social and political reform and modernization plan. It was a six point program whose most important items were land reform, voting rights for women, and a national literacy core for rural communities, as you again heard in the clip earlier. Though some of these reforms were advocated by the Kennedy administration, they had first been proposed by Iran's Tudeh party and other leftist organizations. Though accomplishing some significant results, the White Revolution, uh, which was uh, soon expanded and called the Shah People Revolution, excluded political democratization and was in fact used by the Shah to consolidate his personal rule. Arriving in the midst of the upheaval caused by the White Revolution, the Iran One cohort of Peace Corps volunteers were assigned to training centers for rural secondary school teachers and agricultural extension agents overseen by the Ministry of Education. Earlier Iran land reform campaigns had given some farmers ownership of their land. Thus schools were needed to teach new and modern ways of farming to current farmers and young future farmers. 15 teaching institutions and an agricultural college were built for this effort in cities like Ahvaz, Kermanshah, Rasht, Sari, and Tabriz among others and the Ministry of Education requested volunteers for them. The images here are of, uh, many of you will recognize, uh, Dana Shalela, who taught in Ahvaz, and the other is uh, at the top is of uh, Richard Eaton and Will Loudon, um, and an Iranian teacher colleague at a school near Tabriz. 
The first Peace Corps group arrived in Iran with degrees from America's top schools, uh, resembling the best and brightest whom Kennedy and his brother-in-law, Peace Corps Director Sergeant Schreiber, had hoped to enlist. They came from Boston University, Brandeis, Brown, Cornell, Harvard, Miami University of Ohio, Princeton, Stanford, and the University of Southern California, among others. The Peace Corps had recruited volunteers raised on farms or trained in agriculture. And because Iranian officials knew sports were an important part of American culture, they also requested volunteers to teach PE. Among the first Peace Corps Iran group were athletes in basketball, track, football, and other sports. And indeed, one scholar asserts that over half of the 12,000 Peace Corps volunteers of this time devoted some of their time to sports. In Iran one, a volunteer at Rash Normal School taught English, advised the French and English clubs, and was a swimming coach, while another in Sari taught poultry farming. A volunteer in Ghazdin, English and PE, and their colleague at Ahvaz Agricultural College, horticulture and farm mechanics. So it was inevitable that the Peace Corps would participate in Iranian development projects. As the years went by, changing Iranian government priorities brought in requests for vocational education, community development, rural and municipal public works, city planning, architecture, library science, public health, medicine, uh, to name a few. Uh, there were groups comprised of only married couples, uh, while others had a mix of single and married women and men. In the 1960s, the majority of volunteers were white and in their early to mid 20s. Teaching English in secondary schools and colleges had become the program's mainstay at its mid 1960s peak. By this time, the University of Texas at Austin was one of the principal training centers for Peace Corps Iran's future English teachers. The first University of Austin Peace Corps Iran recruits began training in June of 1965. They were followed by successive groups so that 200 trainees had completed the program in a one year period. Tragically, it was during the summer of 1966 when a lone shooter climbed the University of Texas Tower and killed 15 people one of whom was Peace Corps Ron trainee Thomas Ashton. And uh, the bottom corner image is a memorial to that, those who were killed. Uh, during the mid 1960s, the Peace Corps, known in Persian at this time um, as Sepahe Solhe Amrika, had branched out to virtually every corner of Iran, from cities to towns to villages from Azeri speaking to Kurdish speaking to Arabic speaking provinces. The initial reception of Peace Corps volunteers, uh, however, involved uh, tensions and mistrust at times. In 19, uh, 1960s Iran had a growing modern educated young generation eager to participate in politics and, and hungry for knowledge of the world. This population spearheaded by university students, similar to those pictured here, correctly felt deprived of political participation by the Shah's US backed regime. Amrika was the Shah's patron and therefore any Amrikai in Iran embodied US political intrusion. This viewpoint, while perhaps crude from a volunteer's perspective, reflected the reality of geopolitical asymmetry existing between the two countries. The images here are of uh, Neri Hegland, who taught English in a Kurdish region of Western Iran and her students, and the Peace Corps apartment where Ed Plaisance lived in Kashan. Iranians who were in personal contact with Peace Corps volunteers gradually would come to see them as representing a different kind of America than those who came through Iran on development, military, or State Department affairs, 
and uh, certainly um, different than those who came across their black and white TV screens or uh, on, in Hollywood movies. These young Americans lived on shoestring budgets. They took public transportation and they worked days and evenings making tangible contributions. In some cases, Iranians were perplexed by their seeming lack of professionalism, wearing wrinkled shirts in the classroom or cooking and cleaning for themselves rather than hiring help. But many Peace Corps volunteers were also received according to Iran's legendary hospitality and were befriended by colleagues and students adopted by local families, many of whom were not at all familiar with the Peace Corps and its purpose. An example was Tom Klobe, assigned to community development in the, in the mid-1960s. Klobe's memoir is featured on the slide here, along with several other published Peace Corps Iran personal accounts and anthologies. Klobe's Iranian partners in Mazandaran had selected him to be their collaborator. Though when Klobe arrived in the village of Alang, he learned that his counterparts were already carrying out a successful community development plan, and they didn't really see him so much as a dispenser of exceptional knowledge or know-how. But as an earnest and somewhat exotic American whose company and friendship broke the monotony of village life and it gave them cultural cachet, many Peace Corps volunteers came to the similar realization that they were not authorities from on high when Iranians demonstrated the skills and capacity to manage their own affairs. Nevertheless, they muddled through their daily life and they taught their day and evening classes, they built schools, they drafted municipal plans and ran summer programs for young people. The 1970s proved to be a difficult tension-filled decade for Iranians. Uh, buttressed with skyrocketing oil income, the Shah's modernizing white revolution unfolded with tangible welfare policies, while political control and repression became ever more suffocating. In the 1970s, Savak was becoming more brutal than ever with its publicized tortures, disappearances, killings, and intimidation. Human rights groups issued reports detailing its atrocities at the time. Furthermore, Iran was sitting on one of the world's largest petroleum reserves. In 1972, when the Shah nationalized the oil industry, it began pumping oil at a much faster rate. Its revenue soared from $4.4 billion in 1973 to $21.4 billion in the following year. In the 1970s too, the Nixon administration was imposing zero limits on the Shah's weapons purchases. New US made weapons and fighter jets were coming in faster than the Iranian military could keep up with. After the Kennedy years, no US administration tried to push the Shah in the direction of political reform. The Shah could do as he pleased because he was the most generous foreign customer of US armaments and an American proxy for the intervention for intervention in the Persian Gulf region. Because the Iranian government could now buy anything it wanted, it was no longer in need of free American manpower provided by the Peace Corps. Oil wealth had raised Iran beyond the status of a so-called underdeveloped nation, according to um, US formulas at the time. Like other countries of the global South, Iran was struggling with rapid modernization and social upheaval, but without commensurate improvements in living standards and political rights. An increasing number of young, educated, and middle-class Iranians were equating their frustrations with the Shah with a more generalized frustration with the US in the 1970s. Though rare, Americans living in Iran were targeted by the leftist opposition to the Shah. In 1971, guerrillas tried to kidnap US Ambassador Douglas MacArthur, later managing to assassinate three American military advisors and three civilians who worked for an American company. And also 
Between 71 and 75, dozens of bombing attacks were directed at American targets, uh, hitting the Iran America Society six times, the US Embassy twice, and the Peace Corps office in Tehran. Thus, in the early 70s, Peace Corps Iran was at an impasse, asking whether it could make an effective contribution to Iran while meeting its three goals. In oral histories of today, volunteers of the early 1970s uh, often remembered their dismay, confusion, disillusionment um, with Iranians pursuing American style materialism and popular culture of the time, perceiving them as losing their way to US cultural imperialism. In the 1970s, Iran was awash in American money, American companies and American residents but with little economic development. Furthermore, the decade of development as the 60s are often called, faced new challenges. The Vietnam War and shifts in thinking about the benefits of development led to increasingly vocal constituencies, including Peace Corps volunteers just returned from overseas, offering criticisms of US foreign policy and calls for the dissolution of the Peace Corps as an agency of US imperialism. And the image here, which I think that was also in the film clip, um, marks the May 1970 occupation of the Peace Corps Washington office by 20 return volunteers denouncing um, both the Peace Corps and Nixon's expansion of the war into Cambodia. Peace Corps Iran volunteers, especially those in cities, heard and observed the anger and frustration in Iran, and were certainly aware to varying degrees of what was going on in the US. According to several accounts, a group of volunteers supported by the last Peace Corps Iran director, Quentin Fleming, voted to shut down the program. So rather than officials in Tehran or Washington closing down Peace Corps Iran, it was the volunteers themselves and the program. Whether they accurately predicted the revolution that was to come or had good timing, many Peace Corps volunteers saw that Iranian government priorities and Peace Corps goals no longer aligned as well as they once had. Finally, uh, how can we characterize the Peace Corps legacy in Iran? Understanding the Peace Corps as a product of the US Cold War and its alignment with the Shah's authoritarian modernization doesn't mean American volunteers were agents of US imperialism and Iranians their hapless victims. It is clear from personal testimonies that the Kennedy years brought tremendous optimism to a segment of American youth and a perhaps naive faith in the project of modernization and development globally. By the late 1960s and early 70s, a host of international developments and primarily the Vietnam War shattered that faith. The agency of volunteers also needs to be emphasized. They gave shape and detail to assignments chosen for them many times, often taking them in directions not anticipated. Barclay Moore was mentioned earlier by one of the um, narrators in the clip. Um, Legendary Peace Corps Iran volunteer Barkley Moore, who was assigned to community development in northwestern Iran, stepped far outside of Peace Corps expectations and even fears uh, to mediate between warring Turkmen tribes. And Iranians, most notably, were in no way passive victims of Peace Corps projects. As volunteers have testified, Iranians willingly collaborated when they desired and negotiated with and resisted projects they deemed unessential, redundant, or even insulting. Though the program initially appeared successful in terms of state interests, I think it was most effective in the long term on the people to people front. Even Iranians critical of and opposed to the Shah's regime tended to have a favorable view of the Peace Corps. This is evident in the friendships between, for example, the late Iranian intellectual and cultural critic Ali Shariati and Peace Corps volunteer Michael Hillman. 
and between politicized Iranian students and their Peace Corps teachers. In recent years, personal accounts of the Peace Corps by Iranian Americans are starting to emerge. And I'd say even the, you know, the film, uh, this clip you, you just saw might be considered part of this body of work of Iranian Americans making sense of this experience, deeming it quite positive and sharing it with the world. Likewise, former volunteers credit their cultural immersion as you heard in the film. Um, their cultural immersion and human interactions in Iran with changing their thinking about how to live, act, and feel in the world. And they're passing this knowledge also on to their children. The important part of this Peace Corps legacy is the Peace Corps Iran Association. The occasion of the 25th anniversary of the Peace Corps in 1986 marked the start of the Peace Corps Iran Association, which was revived in 2011 on the anniversary of the Peace Corps 50th anniversary. The tragic break in US-Iran diplomatic relations, uh, Iran's revolution and long war with Iraq, the consolidation of the Islamic Republic, the sanctions and acrimony and the othering and demonization of Iranians and American political and popular culture and consciousness pushed former volunteers to act with some urgency. The Peace Corps Iran Association, PCIA, is today one of the most, if not the most, energetic and productive of returned Peace Corps volunteer groups. Its goals include promoting peace and understanding between Americans and Iranians through outreach, advocacy, and education and launching efforts to preserve the valuable legacy they share with Iranians. PCIA publishes a triannual newsletter and monthly bulletins from its board and advocacy circles. It also took on the labor of building from scratch a directory of former volunteers and staff, lobbying elected representatives on matters involving US-Iran relations. Uh, it hosts a regular book discussion group maintains a digital archive with, uh, along with reconstructing Peace Corps Iran group histories. Every two years, as you heard earlier, hundreds of former volunteers and support staff gather for a reunion conference and this year's will be a virtual meeting on October 2nd. I would sum up my talk today by arguing that the Peace Corps' success in Iran largely rested on the fact that it was a unique American program that enabled meaningful and enduring cultural connections, professional relations and friendships between Iranians and Americans, and that it fulfilled at least two of the three original goals of the Peace Corps Act. In the end, it improved perceptions of Amrika among Americans, and it broadened individual American understandings of themselves and their country's role in the world. Thank you so much for your time today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Kulai. So if we could uh, stop your screen sharing. I will do that. Thank you very much for that really informative uh, talk, Professor Kulai, and putting into context really the political, economic friendship and individual dynamics between Americans and Iranians. And you very uh, nicely put it into context about how the political dynamics were moving on their own trajectory while the friendships cultivated in the beginning, beginning to continue. And it is a good example of how we at the Basketball Institute would like to see the past 40 plus years of mutual satanization and acrimony. On the outside, there is this positive friendship that it is important for 
new generation of Iranians as well as Americans to understand that friendship between Americans and Iranians predates 1979 and Peace Corps is an important component of it. We are getting a lot of questions and with uh, my final comments, I go to Matt, we, who could uh, start uh, with the questions in the chat room and in answer Q&A. So Matt, go ahead, you wanna address some of the questions? Well, we have a question about volunteers and um, I'm wondering if you'd like to comment on what it has been like over the years to spend so much time interviewing and kind of learning from um, the experience of the, the Peace Corps um, uh, volunteers. Yeah, this is a favorite part of what I do. My favorite part is um, getting together every two years. I'm really missing the uh, human to human three-dimensional contact of that. Um, gathering together every two years at the reunion conferences hosted by PCIA and sitting down um, talking with individual um, former volunteers and attending all the events as well. Um, that is really the highlight of this research, honestly, um, collecting those stories, uh, those memories. It's really you know, about memory making for me. Um, we're ga I'm gathering facts when I'm doing those oral history interviews, but uh, I see them much more as people telling stories about their past in the present, right? And sometimes those stories change and the meanings change, um, how people make sense of them uh, can change over time. And, um, but it's, it's really how folks are making sense of their past in the, in the present for me. Um, and the individuals are phenomenal people. They're just, you know, they're active and energetic and um, what I would like to be when I um, am, you know, in, in my 60s, 70s, 80s. And um, so they're really, they're role models as well. Um, so yes, that's, I've enjoyed that part of the research for sure. There is a question um, about the way that Peace Corps was funded. Um, I don't know if you could speak to that at all. Yeah, I'm not, I'm, unfortunately I can't. I mean, I should eventually be able to speak to that, but I have not explored that yet in, in my research. I mean, I know that um, the, uh, there, there was, well, so, so it was funded by, you know, the, the Peace Corps agency by, I think the state, state department. Um, and, but the Iranian host uh, country, the host side also had to pay something. So there was some kind of um, support on both sides. Um, but yeah, I, I can't say more than that at this point. It's interesting how some of these programs involve support from both sides and kind of see in the like um, US government exchange programs that by the mid seventies because of oil boom uh, money that Iran is really paying it seems for the majority of the program by that point. So it even changes over time um, it, within the same program depending on mm -hmm. uh, different circumstances. It's very interesting. Um, I'd like to just ask a quick question as we have more coming in, but um, you made the point about Peace Corps volunteers you know, very intentionally using this term volunteer um, to kind of distinguish themselves from, uh, you know, technical advisors or especially military advisors, kind of other members of the American um, community. Um, but you also Kind of, kind of identify points of connection between them, like Peace Corps volunteers working at institutions that are supported by the U.S. aid program, for instance. Or, um, so I'm, I'm just wondering if you could speak a little bit more about kind of the connections, but also kind of resentments and complicated relationships between um, 
the Peace Corps volunteers and these other Americans that are around at the time. Right. Yeah. So the first point I want to make about that is Peace Corps volunteers were a very a varied group, right? Um, they they didn't all walk in you know in the same manner. They didn't all conduct themselves in the same way. They didn't all have the same ideas. They didn't all have the same experiences in Iran. Um, so they weren't walking, you know, lock and step together all the time. And so they're um, among the accounts I've read and those I've interviewed as well. Um, folks who said that they tried to distance themselves from USAID, uh, technical assistance workers in Iran. Um, they distanced themselves from the US embassy and at some point the, uh, in, in Tehran, at some point it seems the Peace Corps office wanted them to be distanced from it, but they also imposed that distancing on themselves. Um, others who, um, you know, didn't practice that distancing from USAID folks who had friends in among other Americans in Iran. Um, uh, so, so there is there was that dynamic and those differences on the ground, um, and and a part of that might have been according to the you know specificities of the time and the context, right? Um, yeah. So the the separations aren't as clear, I guess, to answer your question more um, directly, aren't as clear. And, you know, they, people socialize together, Americans of different, you know, capacities in Iran got together, including sometimes Peace Corps volunteers um, with, with these other groups of Americans. Um, so there was some bleeding, but I think that also was uh, based on where folks lived and who they socialized with. And some stayed away even from other Peace Corps volunteers. Um, I've had, I've talked to people who said, I really wanted to immerse myself entirely in my host community. I didn't want to have anything to do with other volunteers in the town next door or you know, three hours away. Um, whereas other volunteers socialized um, you know, fairly regularly when they had time with each other. So um, you, see, you see a lot of that going on. Very interesting. So more questions that are coming in, Professor Kulai, and let me uh, uh, give a break to Matt while he's reading them. I, I will read some of those questions. One audience member has asked, the following, did the Peace Corps serve as a demonstration effect for Iran's own literacy corps? Yeah, that's a good question. That comes up a lot, um, or it comes up now and then, I should say, in things that I've read. I would say the, so the literacy corps was a component of the white revolution. And um, certainly there are elements of, um, the Peace Corps there, you know, in the way the Literacy Corps um, worked. But um, people were talking about a type of program like that uh, before the Peace Corps in Iran. It was part of, um, as I mentioned earlier, two-day party discussions um, and platforms. These kinds of ideas were already circulating in Iran prior to um, this, this period and prior to the Peace Corps. Uh, so I would say that, um, that you know, no, <laughs> unless somebody, unless, uh, in, unless, you know, we, we get some more evidence to indicate that there was, you know, there was direct inspiration. Um, but based on what, uh, you know, the evidence that I see, uh, these ideas, the idea for a kind of uh, a literacy corps in Iran kind of predated Kennedy's Peace Corps. Mm. Great, and uh, one of our colleagues, Mary Hecklin, who you kindly show a picture of her. She's asked you this question. Uh, did you look into the motivations that prompted these young Americans to go into the Peace Corps? Did any of them specifically choose Iran or why did they go to Iran? Yeah, 
Among those I've talked to is they were, they were assigned Iran. Um, and they, you, you all know, those of you who are volunteers, you kind of at the outset, when you were applying for the Peace Corps, you, you could select some regions or specific countries, but you were ultimately assigned a country in the end. And um, so among those I've spoken to there, I, I think I can think of, you know, just a few who said that they knew where Iran was, they had studied it in college, they were familiar with it, or they specifically wanted to go there. Um, so no, uh, and again, I, I've talked to a select group, um, even those who attend the PCIA conferences regularly tend to be volunteers from like the mid 1960s when the, the numbers of volunteers were at you know their peak. So I'm my own kind of base of evidence is shaped by, of course, the people I talk to, right? Um, but their motivations, um, uh, you know, certainly for joining the Peace Corps, you're, you're all well familiar with the um, desire to serve one's country, uh, the, you know, as, as an alternative to joining the military, to desire to travel, to um, get out of the U.S. and see the world. Um, and, and there was a sense of, you know, wanting to help others as well. Mm. well thank you very much. And uh, I think uh, one of our board members and former Peace Corps volunteers, John Limbert, has asked this question. Uh, please speak further about the volunteers voting out the Peace Corps program in 76. Yeah. So this is based on uh, the um, account by Quentin Fleming's son and by um, two interviews I did, two oral history interviews I did with um, volunteers who served in the early 70s. Both, all, all three accounts kind of agree on some of the basic parameters that volunteers at the time were feeling like, what am I doing here? Um, Iran has so much money now, they don't need us. They can pay for you know, someone else to do this work. There are Iranians who can do this work at this point in time. You know? So they were feeling kind of redundant. Um, and then for all the other reasons, um, feeling like, you know, this was not, um, you know, we're being, we're being outnumbered by Americans here who um, are earning top dollar to, you know, to do the kind of work we do to teach English or um, to work in computer systems or et cetera. Um, and feeling more kind of alienated from um, Americans in Iran who were growing in number in, in this time and who certainly swamped um, or outnumbered the Peace Corps volunteers who were there. And so there were discussions among the volunteers and the, uh, the director himself initiated these discussions and a meeting and said that there would be a vote. Um, and that vote was taken to end the program like in at, at the end of their service or in like the next two years. Now there were folks who were posted, um, who I interviewed who were not in Tehran when these discussions were going on. So they had no idea that they were going on. They didn't vote themselves or they don't remember voting for it. Um, but, uh, but among those who, who did remember it, their, their story does, um, does complement Quentin Fleming's. Mm, great. And there is a comment in the Quentin chat. Quentin Fleming's son. I'm sorry, his oh, son. son. Yes, yeah. thanks. Uh, there is a comment in the chat room about the documentary filmmakers' work and complimenting them for bringing this amazing work together, but also ends with a very fascinating statement. We'll like to see what the documentarians think about that statement that uh, this Peace Corps experience of Iran has not only been important between Iranians and American friendships, but also between the Peace Corps volunteers themselves, in a way, creating that organic solidarity, mechanical solidarity within them to create the Peace Corps of Iran. So could 
Hussein or Abbas speak to that, whether their experience of filming these volunteers, did they notice this kind of a motivations or this natural energy building among them that they do constitute a unique group now uh, with respect to other Peace Corps volunteers? Well, certainly the experience that we had uh, confirms that commodity uh, that be between them, uh, especially, of course, it's, it, it highlights the fact that uh, although they are in a relatively advanced age, they do get together uh, every now and then and very enthusiastically. Uh, PCIA is probably one of the most active, at least this was my experience and exposure to Peace Corps in general. I haven't had a chance to uh, you know, explore other uh, Peace Corps uh, volunteers in other countries, but there is a camaraderie between the members uh, tremendously. They feel um, uh, as a um, an, a um, sort of a group that has not been appreciated or explored enough or exposed enough on their efforts. So, and and some of them are, have an interesting point of view because when we approach them, um, it was as if we are opening a very personal uh, memory line that they have had difficulty of sharing it with even their own families mm -hmm. uh, because there was not a, um, a, a bonding or a relevance that they felt that it would, uh, you know, it, it would be proper for them to discuss this. So we also experienced that, that we are, we are touching uh, on subject that is, that most of them find it very personal um, and, uh, obviously had a, a profound impact on their um, uh, life, uh, their direction in life. So it was, it was, uh, it's just an amazing experience. The fact that they are getting still uh, together um, uh, confirms that, uh, that uh, uh, element. And of course, Professor can more uh, highlight uh, on that issue. Go ahead, Professor Kulai, would you like to comment on that, uh, about the solidarity formed among the Peace Corps volunteers of Iran and how their experience today is beginning to kind of blossom out into conference activities, kind of uh, activities that kind of creates a community today that is very unique to them. Yeah, every, every conference I've been to, I try to corner the, um, National Peace Corps representative who attends and and ask some questions about you know how this group compares to others that um, they're familiar with, and um, they they've told me it this is like the most active group. Um, at, at one point, this was in 2015, I think, in Austin, uh, the person in attendance there told me. Well, the uh, the South Korea group is pretty active too, but this one's right there, you know, with them. Um, and then two years ago, or th was it two years? Yeah, two years ago, the national rep was saying, "No, this group has, you know, outdone the the Korea group, the return volunteers from Korea." So, so yeah, I mean, their their energy is is impressive. The work that they do is um, so important. Um, and and there's a there's a an acknowledgement that this is a legacy they share with Iranians. So it's um, Iranians are and Iranian Americans are included in their programs um, as whether you know speakers or performers or documentarians or um, uh, authorities. Um, so it, it's an inclusive group as well, I would say, and, and um, among the leadership as well as the programming that they do. Yeah, that's very good. And I think uh, the question from Professor Michael Zorinsky touches on the research that Matt has been doing, I think, in a way, uh, about the role of the Presbyterian missionaries, how that kind of evolved into the Peace Corps volunteers. So Professor Zorinsky asked this question. Could you compare the experience impact of uh, Peace Corps volunteers to those of the Presbyterian missionaries? I'm thinking that the Peace Corps volunteers were short-termers 
whereas so many of the missionaries devoted their entire careers to the country. So I guess both Matt and Professor Kulai can talk about that question. You want to go first, Matt? I just think, it, I mean, it's an interesting question. Howard Baskerville was a short-termer, right? Um, more or <laughs> less was sent to Iran to, with the same, you know, kind of term of service as a Peace Corps volunteer. Yeah. Um, so I would just, you know, um, maybe echo um, uh, Professor Zerinsky's question and, and turn it to, to you. Go ahead, Professor Gulai. Yeah. Um, so, Yes, I've heard Peace Corps volunteers in other literature too have, have sometimes been uh, compared to or called even secular missionaries, right? The term the term abounds, and and I think that um, certainly um, they shared with missionaries, uh, you know, uh, some characteristics. You know, there was a, a high level of kind of personal commitment to the work that they were doing. There was a humanitarian spirit. Um, uh, you know, leaving comfortable lives, right, uh, to venture out into an um, unfamiliar um, context. Um, and then uh, a belief, at least among certain Peace Corps volunteers, maybe not everybody had this belief, but um, I th certainly think it was part of their training that, you know, there would be American know how to their host community and that they would improve that community as a result. Um, I, I, I never, I've never come across in the literature any kind of religious um, component to the Peace Corps. It may have been there, but I have never seen it um, or come across it, as I said, but certainly there is that, that sense of service that was very strong that you see uh, in, for both missionaries and Peace Corps volunteers. Right, so it's very it interesting. Combined, yeah, go, I'm sorry, go ahead. So it, was, it, is a, it is a legitimate observation to kind of combine the two together, right? In terms of the modern history of Iran, when you look at the missionaries and the Peace Corps, is a, uh, it is a legitimate uh, narrative to connect the two together because they both had contributions, both in education, medical field, agriculture, right? And, uh, and also the how the Peace Corps. So as a historian, do you see that continuity? Yeah, I, I would just kind of weigh in and say that it was interesting to see that in the documents, the missionaries had opinions about all the different Americans that were in Iran. They kind of seemed to appreciate the Mormons, for instance. Right. Um, in the 60s, you see fairly positive kind of assessments um, by missionaries kind of writing to other missionaries. We just had some Peace Corps volunteers show up in our village <laughs> and others are kind of hearing of the program and generally approving of it, um, which is interesting because the missionaries were kind of hard, a hard sell. <laughs> um, but as far as uh, motivation, I'll kind of combine Bahman's point with a question we have, um, because ultimately, you know, missionaries went to Iran for a particular reason, especially by the mid 20th century, you could choose to be a missionary or choose to be an aid worker or choose to be an international educator. And if you're with a mission service, a mission organization, um, you know, you're, you have a very particular goal, even if it's kind of shown outwardly in different ways. Um, but we have a question about kind of what might have motivated the Peace Corps volunteers, especially if it wasn't about religion and God and things like that. Um, uh, the question asks if it's safe to assume that a lot of the volunteers were maybe left leaning or, you know, kind of progressive, somewhat idealist, um, who would have been drawn to Iran in the first place or attracted to a Kennedy program. And maybe this could help us understand their relationships, different relationships with Iranians on the ground, maybe their decision to end um, the program in 1976 um, uh, as, as well. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think, yes. Um, when asked why you joined, I think um, there's, there's a pattern in how people have responded to that question. And, 
And yes, I was idealistic. I wanted to travel the world. I wanted to make a contribution. I wanted to, um, for, for some men who, you know, joined during the Vietnam War, I wanted to, um, in, in some cases, it was the alternative to the draft. Um, in one case, it was, uh, somebody I interviewed was a Quaker, and this was his way of serving um, uh, with a draft, you know, an alternate to, to being drafted for war. Um, so, you know, people give kind of similar responses to that, that question. And I think that's a really interesting point about how that um, then shaped their experience when they were there. Um, the expectations they brought to their service in Iran and then how that um, shaped. And I have to think more about that and, and, and look more carefully at that to see um, how, that, how that may have changed things on the ground. Um, but during the 60s, people say that they're joining because they were inspired by Kennedy. Um, Kennedy comes up a lot was inspired by Kennedy to serve my country, to travel, you know, and then I wanted to travel the world and then I wanted to also do these other things. That's great. And so with one final comment, that was very nice of you, Professor Kulai, to take so time, so much time. So we end with this final comment and ask all panelists to uh, respond to it. Among other Americans, we do not always appreciate their view about Iran and Iranians. We feel that we have a group of supporters that are also concerned about Iran and Iranians and hope to support the welfare of Iranians. So there is this Peace Corps uh, Association that we've talked about and the Peace Corps group today. They do have certain empathy for Iranian people and how after 40 plus years of revolution, their situation has been impacted. So in a way, kind of, they become spokespeople for the welfare of the Iranians. Uh, so could you comment a little bit about that and see how from Peace Corps volunteers they have transformed into now people with empathy for the Iranian people? You can go ahead first, Professor Kulai. I might, um... I might hand that over to the filmmakers because they had, uh, I think they had a lot of conversations too. Go ahead. I, I would certainly yeah. agree with your statement, Dr. Yeah. Bakhtiari. Yeah. Good. So, Jose? Well, let me see. Am I on? Yes. Um, uh, the, uh, uh, certainly, we had the same experience. Uh, they, uh, the group are, um, you know, my general feeling about their experience as a Peace Corps volunteer is that, that they have, uh, that experience has become part of their identification. Uh, it is very difficult to separate the two mm -hmm. uh, as if Iran has become part of their identity to the extent that they have shown obviously quite an interest in following what is happening with Iran. You know, this has been 40 plus or 60 plus years that they've been in Iran, but it's amazing to see how dedicated they are in following up with events and affairs in Iran. And um, they take, uh, you know, political positions. They are very active in particularly uh, in efforts against war um, against sanctions, I've seen petitions, I've seen uh, uh, collaborative efforts, I've seen uh, uh, satellite entities that they have put together uh, in influencing their community or their, their politicians, uh, local and, and, and federal. So um, yes, it is not just uh, getting together and chatting about old memories. Uh, they are very vocal. Uh, participate in the political uh, discourse. Um, and, um, you know, I, and I, as an Iranian American, feel, uh, uh, you know, uh, very close to what, what and how they perceive Iran uh, as part of their, uh, uh, you know, own uh, uh, realm that they think that they, they have to uh, somehow be, you know, uh, be involved 
and um, and see and, and participate in anything that can help the Iranian uh, people well-being in general. Mm. Thank you. Uh, Abbas, would you like to comment too? Oh, I guess Abbas, would you like to comment? Oh, I was mute. Sorry. Yeah. No, I mean, uh, Mrs. Kola, he covered everything and Hussein said about everything that we um, should know for the first session. <laughs> well, I want to really thank you for uh, participating in our first session. It was a very informative session. I thought that mixing the documentary and the presentation by Professor Kulai gave it such a human dimension of really seeing Iran during the time of the Peace Corps too, because Iran today is very different than Iran of uh, 60 years ago. And what the population of the Iran at that time was around 30 million, right? Today, population is of over 80 million. So the changes that we have witnessed in Iran is also has impacted how people perceive Iran today. And uh, I noticed that the Peace Corps Iran is really has maintained that heritage look toward Iran. So it could be called the Peace Corps heritage as Hossein also has made, maintained the name. So there's a very fascinating connections. It's gonna be a continuing discussion. I encourage all our audience members to go to the website of the Peace Corps Iran Association and register for the conference on October 2nd. And I think Professor Kulai is making a presentation in that conference. They're, they also have a Persian panel. So they have a panel just in Persian. So uh, I encourage everybody to check their website and register for that conference. Our, we have we do have a speaker and an event on Utah universities and Iran. Professor Kulai mentioned the connection between Utah State. We have Professor Ricky Garlitz, who is going to give a presentation on Utah universities and Iran in October. So we encourage you to also register for that. Again, thank you for joining us and thank you to our panelists, filmmakers for coming. And Matt, thank you to you for hosting the question and answer. We look forward to seeing you in other events. Thank you. Thank you.